Chapter 10 Gliders Down Holson jumped, followed quickly by Nut Hogland, Arne Kildrups, and Klaus Helberg. The wind tore and pulled at me as I fell, remembered Helberg. Suddenly, the parachute filled with air and stiffened. There was a violent jerk as it opened wide above me. In the sky around him, Helberg could see the other men, along with the supply crates the British crew had tossed out of the plane behind them. I found myself floating slowly down toward the ground, Helberg recalled. With all our equipment, twelve huge containers floating down through the moonlight behind us and the plane dis disappearing westwards. Helberg hit the ground hard but safely. He sat in the deep snow thinking, and here we are in Norway, cold and inhospitable, but marvelous all the same. The men gathered and unrolled their sleeping bags. At sunrise, they could begin looking for the supply crates. For now, nothing more could be done. Holson took out his pipe and filled it with tobacco. It's time I told you the truth, he said. He lit a match and looked at the men. To prevent word of the secret mission from leaking out, he explained. They'd been told that they were coming to Norway to train other resistance fighters. That was just a cover story, Holson now informed them, touching the match to match flame to his pipe. We're here on a far more vital assignment to help destroy the heavy water factory at Vemork. He gave them the details and told them about the British commandos who'd, been, who'd be coming in by plane. The operation would take place during the next full moon. We have four weeks to, to reconnoiter the planet, get the information on the German guards, and check on the landing site. None of the team members made any objection to what, for them, was a radical change in plans. Good night, Polson said. In the morning, the men took out their maps and compasses, checked nearby landmarks, and realized the Br British plane had badly missed the intended drop target. They were at least 65 min mountainous miles from the glider landing site. All expert seers, they weren't worried about the skiers, they weren't worried about the distance. But they would be carrying more than 600 pounds of weapons and supplies, and they could expect no help along the way. We had been told to make no outside contacts except in the gravest emergency, Polson said. It was important that we avoid being seen by anyone. The 12 equipment crates were scattered in the deep snow, and it took the men two days to find them. They divided the stuff into eight loads of about 70 pounds each, figuring it would be foolish to carry more the, over the rough terrain ahead. Finally, they put on their boots and skis and set off. Progress was slow since they each had to handle two 70-pound loads. They would ski a set distance with one load, put it down, return to the starting point, pick up the second load, and make the trip again. Making things worse, it had been a relatively mild autumn on the Hardanger Plateau. The snow was wet and sticky, the ice on the lake still thin, forcing them to take the long way around the water. The men reminded each other of an old Norwegian saying, A man who is a man goes on until he can go no further, and then goes twice as far. The team had enough food for 30 days, but they were burning calories so quickly they were constantly ravenous. What saved them was that along the way they found several summer can cabins abandoned for the winter. Inside they scrounged a few cans of food, a few handfuls of flour. and one cabin they found sitting on the table a frozen lump of unidentified meat. They chopped it up with an axe, dropped the pieces into a pot with snow, and set the pot over a fire. We ate our fill for the first time since our arrival, Polson said. On November 9th, after three grueling weeks on the plateau, Polson and the team finally reached their assigned base near the glider landing site. The men found a thin-walled cabin nearby, stumbled inside, built a fire, and felt lucky to find some food. We made fish soup, Polson said. Good soup, too. Out of dog's food. The next step was to contact London. With wind whipping snow crystals in his face, Nut Hogland set up his radio antenna on the roof of the cabin. He climbed down, slammed the door behind him, dove into his sleeping bag on the floor, and pulled the radio close. As snow blew in through the cracks in the wall, Hogland tapped out a coded message. The team was intact and healthy and would now begin scouting the target area and preparing the landing site. The message was received in London, but it didn't sound right. Telegraph messages were sent using Morse code in which each letter of the alphabet is represented by a certain combination of long and short sounds. Every telegraph operator has what's known as an operator's fingerprint. 
Each person taps out the sound slightly differently. British intelligence had Hogland's fingerprints on file. This new message was not a match. What they didn't take into account was that Hogland's fingers were frozen stiff when he sent most of the most recent message. Concerned they might actually be in contact with German agents, the British sent Hogland a pre-arranged security question, something only he could answer. What did you see walking down the strand in the early hours of January 1, 1941? Hogland's blue fingers tapped back. Three pink elephants. Polson's team was all right, the British knew. The plan could proceed. On a drizzly afternoon, 10 days later, 34 British commandos gathered on an airfield in Scotland. They divided into groups of 17, and each group climbed into a glider. These were super light wooden planes, especially, especially made for Britain's Royal Air Force. They had no engines, which meant that they could fly silently. Perfect for making an unnoticed approach into enemy territory. Of course, the gliders couldn't take off by themselves. Each was attached by a rope to a Halifax bomber. The bombers took off, towing the gliders behind them. The planes headed east across the water as the sun set. On the ground in Norway, Poulsen and his team found the best possible landing spot and set up lights along the strip of land. It was overcast, Poulsen said, but the moon was full. At 11 p.m., the Norwegians heard the hum of engines in the thick clouds above but they couldn't see the planes and the pilots couldn't see the landing lights. As one of the bomber pilots was turning around to make another run over the target area, the rope pulling the glider snapped. The glider pilot felt his plane descending. He couldn't even see even a few feet in any direction and with no engines had no way to keep the plane in the air for long. The glider slammed into a snowy hillside. Eight men were killed instantly. Of the survivors, four had broken bones the others, the other five, just minor injuries. Two of the men who were able to walk made it to a nearby farmhouse and convinced the owner to call a doctor. The doctor agreed to come, but before leaving, alerted the Gestapo of the crash. The Germans arrived to search the plane and crash site. They found weapons, snowshoes, Norwegian currency, radio transmitters, and a map with Venmork circled in blue ink. The Germans loaded the four badly injured men into a truck. By the accepted rules of war, the British soldiers should have been treated as prisoners of war. Instead, the Germans poisoned them and dropped their bodies into the sea. The other five were taken to a concentration camp and interrogated by the Gestapo. They refused to give more than their name, rank, and a service number. German soldiers blindfolded and handcuffed the prisoners and shot them in the head. The second glider story was similar. It lost its way in the fog and crash-landed, killing several of the crew. The Germans quickly found the wreck, questioned the survivors, then shot them and dumped them in a ditch. The next night, Polson's team got the news from London. The glider disaster was a hard blow, he later said. It was sad and bitter. Thirty-four British soldiers were dead and nothing had been accomplished. Worse than nothing, because now the Germans knew that the Allies considered Venmork a high-priority target. British intelligence soon learned that German commanders had assigned extra soldiers to guard Venmork night and day. They had begun placing landmines around the plant. Meanwhile, the plant continued pumping out heavy water, which was piped into barrels and shipped to Germany. This had to be stopped, no matter the risks. Colonel Watson contacted the Norwegian volunteers who were, stand, who were still training in Scotland. He told them, stand by for a particularly dangerous enterprise.